yeah. if it's too yeah, exactly. <laughs> too new realism based. <laughs> Oh, I guess once you're ready. Yes, yeah. okay. Hello, and welcome to the month of October. Although October is almost on its way out, we are presenting our seminar session for this month as part of our year long One World, One Health, One Medicine seminar series. I trust that this month has been great for you thus far, and thank you for joining us in this particular seminar focusing on One Health once again. For today's seminar, we are very pleased actually to have with us Professor Sarah Cleveland, who is a visiting professor at St. George's University and as part of our community engaging in One Health, One Medicine. Professor Cleveland is in fact world renowned and she has partnered with us as, as an ongoing initiative in developing conferences, workshops, symposium on One Health and One Medicine. And Professor Cleveland actually presented in our most recent One Health, One Medicine symposium held at our campus in Grenada. Now, this topic is an interesting topic because it hopefully exemplifies the interactions between humans, animals, and environment, but also from a global context as well. So we very much look forward to the seminar presentation. But there's some housekeeping announcements before we begin. If you have any questions, any comments, any discussions, what we will request for you to do is to hold until the end of the seminar, and then you can raise your hand, and John, who always joins us online, he will assist us in moderating the conversation. But I would like to request of Professor Cleveland to speak more about herself, her experiences as well, because I think it's helpful for all of us to understand the background and the context which informs your work and your experiences as well. So I would now like to leave you in the most capable hands of Professor Cleveland and do enjoy the seminar presentation for this month of October. Professor Cleveland, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Budesi. It's really a great pleasure to be here in Grenada. It's my first time to this beautiful country um, and to this university. Um, and I very much enjoyed the interactions that I've had so far with colleagues and, and students here. Um, and uh, learned many interesting things from the One Health, One Medicine Symposium where I gave this presentation just a couple of days ago. Um, as a ba my background is as a veterinarian. Um, I also trained actually before then as a zoologist. And so I perhaps have a sort of more instinctive um, bent towards thinking about One Health in uh, the broader context of disease and, and their interactions. Um, I've been working most of my professional career in Tanzania, although I'm based at the University of Glasgow, my research program is very much in Tanzania, and it'll be the work in Tanzania that very much forms the focus of this presentation. So um, I'll be talking about One Health um, in the context really of two main themes, which is about understanding interactions, so interactions between host populations, human, domestic animals, wild animals, uh, between host individuals and the environment, for example, and also interactions and uh, collaborations between different disciplines, which are really a core element of One Health. And I'll also be talking about why I think One Health is so important in terms of informing interventions, particularly in terms of uh, the most sort of equitable and effective approaches to some of um, the uh, important global health problems that we're facing. So, um, I just wanted to start really by acknowledging that this is work that's been done with a, a lot of partners. Um, I've had some wonderful collaborations um, with institutions in Tanzania as well as in the UK and elsewhere. Um, as you'll see from this uh, long list here, um, they do span a range of human health as well as veterinary medical institutions and institutions um, that have a focus on wildlife um, disease research. So I think that also gives a flavour of the type of interactions that are involved when you are embarking on research in One Health. Um, Tanzania is a wonderful country to be doing One Health research in. Um, it's uh, a country that is blessed with enormous natural resources and a wonderful natural ecosystems that I'm sure many of you have heard of, world-renowned areas such as the Serengeti, the Salu Game Reserve, Manyara National Park, Kilimanjaro. In fact, 
28% of its land comprises wildlife protected areas, which is really one of the largest proportions of protected um, land anywhere in the world. But alongside this very abundant wildlife resource, we also have a very large livestock population. Tanzania holds the third la largest livestock population in Africa. And many people in Tanzania uh, are highly dependent on livestock for their livelihoods. Um, and it's true to say that the health, the well-being, um, livelihoods of people very much depend on livestock health and productivity. So immediately um, you see there a very important connection in terms of one health. Rather more on the negative side, Tanzania also has a wide range of different types of disease problems that are actually all interacting and intersecting now in ways that we don't entirely understand. Um, there are a large number of endemic and neglected infectious diseases, including the zoonotic diseases. Those are diseases transmitted from animals to people. Um, and Tanzania has been identified as one of the sort of hotspots for endemic zoonoses. It's also an area where uh, you have very close proximity between wild animals, livestock and people. And we know that this can be a flashpoint for emergence. Um, of some of the emerging zoonoses. But at the same time, against this backdrop of, non, uh, of, of infectious diseases, we see a growing burden of non-communicable diseases, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer. Um, and so there's some very interesting and challenging problems now facing the, the health sector. Um, and we in One Health, I think, have an important role to play in trying to look at a across some of these disease problems um, and the populations that are affected. So just to point out this area in north, uh, northwestern Tanzania um, is the area where our research is focused. The clearer um, sort of protected area in the center there is the Serengeti ecosystem, the Serengeti National Park and surrounding game reserves. And you can see immediately that it's surrounded by very uh, high density livestock populations. I should note that there are no fences um, around the Serengeti, um, so there are, it's a potential for a lot of contact here between livestock and uh, domestic animals. And wildlife do roam freely beyond the boundaries of the protected area, and there is frequent contact there um, uh, with people and, and their domestic animals. So this is just a list of my current disease interests. Um, and I'm going to be touching on them all to some degree in this presentation. Um, so I won't go into detail on each of them now, but just to point out that there are some common themes around these diseases. They're all caused by pathogens, so disease agents that can infect multiple hosts. And so almost by definition, the epidemiology of these diseases is often quite complex and trying to unravel transmission dynamics and identify reservoirs of infection has been a very important theme of the work that we've been doing. But because they can infect many host species, they also have a wide range of impacts and I'll be discussing some of these in more detail. But one of the reasons why we focus on these diseases and why I'm particularly interested in trying to understand the epidemiology better is because we can see that there are routes to intervention and, and, and trying to generate some immediate impact. So all of these diseases um, are amenable to preventive interventions. And in fact, many of them have, for example, vaccines um, that have been used to control livestock diseases in many um, more industrialized countries and agricultural environments, but are still not very uh, effectively deployed in lower income settings. And so trying to understand how to develop those interventions and make an impact on these disease problems is a, a growing area of interest. And we describe this really as sort of learning through interventions. It's a sort of type of adaptive management. Through our One Health research, we're increasingly aware of the power of interventions as a research tool, particularly when we're trying to unravel reservoir dynamics. Um, and I'll illustrate this in the talk with reference to both rabies and rinderpest. But of course, if you're doing an intervention as part of your research, you're also at the same time generating impact. That in itself is a very rewarding interaction. Um, but it also allows you to develop sort of iterative process whereby you're generating insights from the intervention, whether those are epidemiological or operational. It allows you to have an impact, but at the same time, it allows you to improve your 
intervention in what we describe as a sort of virtual cycle of intervention leading to impacts and insights and that are mutually reinforcing. So I just uh, go back to the sort of basic premise of much of this talk today about the critical interdependencies between livestock health and human health. Um, livestock are crucial for the food security, health, livelihoods of some of the world's poorest people. Um, in terms of food security, they are important because of obvious source of uh, protein and high quality food such as milk and meat. But they're actually also very important for crop based agriculture because of the reliance on traction animals um, for ploughing fields, for example. And the manure uh, coming from livestock is actually a very important fertilizer um, of crop based agricultural systems. Many of the world's poorest people are those people who rely most on livestock um, and uh, we can see that these are, these are communities that are often suffering high levels of poverty and malnutrition. Livestock are also critical assets, they're important in local and regional trade, they're a very important part of reduced vulnerabilities of people in poorer communities. Um, they're very complex. Uh, sharing arrangements and traditional systems of support within some of, of these communities uh, through complex sort of loan arrangements whereby families support each other in times of difficulty. Um, and because livestock are mobile, they can also move if people are displaced or have to move because of uh, climatic fluctuations and um, uh, impacts, they're also able to take those assets with them. And livestock are very important as a form of sort of social status. They're important for social capital and social protection. So we can see that uh, in many ways that the health of livestock will contribute to the sustainable development goals. And actually during the symposium, we had a great presentation from Pro Professor Guy Palmer at Washington State University, who um, described a really interesting relationship whereby interventions in livestock to produce health, in this case, livestock vaccination, led to not only increased income generation in households, but that income was, they could demonstrate, was used directly for enhanced expenditure on health provision for families. Um, and also um, more money was spent on uh, childhood education, particularly for girls. So we can see these sort of ripple effects beyond those direct interrelationships. Uh, towards the really fundamental importance of livestock in these societies. They're absolutely the heart of who people are, uh, how they define themselves, and that how they can survive. But we should be aware that things are changing very fast in many different parts of the world. I'm very aware of it in Tanzania. Um, and this is a, a quite a poignant photograph for me because it shows a Maasai pastoralist here on the left um, overseeing uh, a crop-based cultivation um, of, of land in his area, uh, which would be something that you probably would never have seen 10 years ago. It's not something that's welcomed by pastoralists. And in fact, many of the people who engage in the agricultural activities are, are incomers from different ethnic groups who come and settle uh, in the area. So as well as the change in land use and the ecological systems, there's also quite a bit of social disruption as a result of this um, ethnic um, diversity. Um, so we see expansion of crop-based agriculture, a very important um, feature of the um, landscapes that we're working in. Globally, um, this is really just reflecting sort of changing patterns of demand for and consumption of meat and milk. We know that in many parts of the world, particularly as uh, communities are, are urbanizing, um, demand for meat and milk uh, often rises. And with that, we see uh, increasing complex com complexity of, of uh, value chains for meat and milk and that can uh, affect disease risk in many ways. And we also see particularly in the semi-arid and arid rangeland systems that shifts in uh, livestock ownership in, in relation to environmental change and in the areas we're working this is really largely as a result of the increased climatic variability with more extreme climate events and particularly uh, recent a severe droughts that have affected the area with increasing frequency and severity. And just one example of this is that we're seeing a shift towards keeping sheep and goats in preference to cattle. Cattle have always been considered the highest status species, but now 
uh, we're seeing people preferentially after a drought, for example, restocking with a small ruminants rather than cattle. And this is already translating into changes in how diseases are being spread, uh, different risk factors and different infection dynamic patterns. So for example, brucellosis, which is an important disease of livestock, it also causes a debilitating human health problem, can be caused by pathogens that infect sheep and goats as well as those that infect cattle. And in the past, a lot of the emphasis has been on thinking about interventions in cattle and assuming that cattle have been the most important uh, source of disease. And it probably reflects the fact that cattle have generally considered been considered the highest status species, both by livestock keepers and by uh, veterinary authorities. But it turns out that, in fact, in this system now, what we're seeing is the epidemiology of brucellosis being driven very largely by infection in sheep and goats. Human infection is driven by levels of infection in sheep and goats and cattle infections as well are determined by sheep and goat patterns. And I think this has not only implications for epidemiology but when we're thinking about what interventions to implement, obviously our target host in this case would need to be focused more towards sheep and goats than, than to cattle which have traditionally been the focus of attention. But it also means that we may struggle with trying to uh, implement effective and large-scale interventions, particularly if it requires farmers to pay for vaccination, because sheep and goats are much less valuable as a species, and the whole interaction and development of sort of market-based interventions um, uh, for controlling these types of diseases may be quite challenging. But we're also seeing, uh, and although we're not sure exactly of the relationships, the emergence of new disease problems. And just one example from my recent visit to Tanzania a few weeks ago is a disease that's known as Ormillo uh, by the Maasai pastoralists. And this disease is uh, seniorosis. Uh, seniorosis is the disease caused by the larval stage of the tapeworm Tinea multisets. It has quite a complex life cycle involving dogs primarily, which are the definitive host, um, and intermediate hosts being the sheep and goats. And so the um, adult tapeworms, it's a cestode infection, grow, uh, it, as you can see in this figure on, uh, on the left, uh, in the intestinal tract of dogs, um, who then shed the eggs, the oocysts, um, in feces onto the pasture. Sheep and goats consume those eggs, uh, become infected, the larvae, uh, then migrate to the brain um, and cause these um, cysts, which you can see in the image there. It's sort of large, very large fluid filled cysts, um, which if then consumed by the dog, sort of uh, completes the life cycle and perpetuates the disease. So this is emerging now as one of the highest priority diseases for pastoralists in East Africa. And it's quite unusual to sort of see a cestode infection um, manifest in this sort of epidemic way, um, but we think that is being driven very much by uh, a, a large increase in the sheep and goat populations. Um, but it seems to be a very dramatic problem, but we are now looking at ways to develop interventions to prevent it. So livestock diseases have these multiple impacts on pr uh, productivity, food security, uh, and indirectly and, and directly on human health. Um, I'll be talking a bit later in the uh, talk about land use uh, conflicts as a result of transmission between domestic animals and wildlife. Um, but I want to first focus on the zoonotic diseases. So these are diseases that cause both productivity losses um, uh, in cattle, uh, as well as a direct cause of human health problems. And there are a large number that have this sort of double whammy effect that can be really devastating for poor farmers. But most of these zoonoses, uh, these endemic zoonoses, we would term neglected. Um, and there are many reasons uh, why they've been largely neglected by public health authorities. Um, we describe the problem as a, a public health problem hiding in plain sight. It's, there are many reasons why they're falling off the radar. Um, but it's not because um, these diseases are not a problem. It's, it's much more a question of perception and a lack of data on the true impact. So just some of the factors that we think uh, are making a major contribution to the sort of invisibility of these endemic zoonoses. 
in, include factors like that, that these diseases uh, cause a, often cause diseases with very non-specific clinical signs. And I, I'm going to be focusing a lot on the, the syndrome of fever in this presentation. And there are many, many different causes of fever. Um, and it can be very hard to distinguish clinically between these different causes. One of the challenges with diagnosing many of these zoonoses is that they are best diagnosed uh, during the acute phase of presentation. And what we see, particularly for people from the poorer communities, is that it can often take a very long time to reach hospital. There are many uh, constraints to people getting to hospital on time, and many people uh, seek uh, treatment before they get to a health facility, either self-medicating using antibiotics and antimicrobials um, before they get to hospital. But that in itself can make the diagnosis a lot more difficult. There are very few reliable point-of-care diagnostic tests for these diseases, even in well-developed health systems. Um, in the chronic stages of presentation, diseases like leptospirosis or Q fever uh, can be very difficult to diagnose. In terms of data collection and trying to ascertain the true impact and prevalence, uh, there are really quite poor surveillance systems that even if there were good diagnostic tests, it would be very likely that that data would get lost somewhere between um, the point of care um, diagnosis and sort of central authorities. And I think one of the most important factors is that these diseases disproportionately affect impoverished and neglected communities. So I've used the term already neglected zoonoses or neglected diseases and I think it's a bit of a misnomer really um, because the diseases themselves are not neglected. I mentioned earlier on that we actually have tools to control and prevent these diseases in most higher income countries. They're really not a problem for us, uh, the more wealthy communities um, in the world. The reason that they're neglected uh, in Tanzania is because, uh, and other lower income countries is because the communities that are affected are impoverished and neglected. Um, and we can see the challenges that are facing people trying to get access to high quality health systems. This image is very typical of health facilities um, in many parts of Africa. A large number of patients, few trained health professionals struggling to the best that they can, little laboratory infrastructure, few point of care diagnostic tests. Um, but we're also increasingly aware of the social and economic constraints and challenges that are faced by the poorest people getting to these facilities. This is a difficult situation for everyone, but if you're a, a vulnerable person coming from a poor community, uh, lacking in influence, and that can often mean women, um, actually getting to the line to seeing a physician is often very difficult. It can also be very expensive. And this quote comes from a colleague of mine who did her PhD looking at the experiences of people seeking treatment for fever in Tanzania. And what came across very strongly is while the fever itself uh, was uh, of concern, and some of these fevers have quite a high case fatality rate, so they're serious diseases, but it wasn't so much the fever that was feared by people, it was actually the fear of the payment, the consequences of having to try and raise those, uh, that money what that meant then for the rest of the family if those funds could not be used for other purposes. So in this case, uh, the, the quote from this lady is, I have a fear of the payment and not of the sickness. She knows that she can and should be able to get treatment, but she just can't get enough money and time um, to access that treatment effectively. Um, and uh, in terms of fever, I, I mentioned that there are many different causes of fever, but in Africa, uh, generally, you often find that cases of fever are invariably diagnosed as malaria. The good news, actually, in terms of malaria is that um, falciparum malaria is declining across um, most of um, sub-Saharan Africa. It's a, it's a really good news story. But the flip side of that is even though cases of malaria going down rapidly, we're still seeing a lot of uh, cases of fever being presented to hospital. It's still one of the most common reasons for people to present um, to, to hospital facilities. And this study was carried out by a colleague of mine, John Crump, um, shown here. Um, and with the decline in malaria, he was interested to actually try and work out what was causing the remaining fevers that people were presenting with. <clears throat> 
And so he set up a study uh, involving almost 900 patients that were hospitalized for fever at a tertiary referral hospital in Tanzania in Moshi. Um, and uh, the people came in and received at first a clinical diagnosis. And perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, as we might expect, most of these cases were diagnosed as malaria, even uh, with a lack of a positive confirmatory test. And, and many of them were treated for malaria. When the final results came in, and the results were very different indeed. When you look at the uh, top ch pie chart there, you can see that malaria caused less than 2% of all the fever cases, even though it was diagnosed in 62% of people. And what we see in the colored pies in the bottom circle is a large number of zoonotic diseases. Um, overall, these zoonoses um, are accounted for about a third of the cases of fever. So this is not a trivial burden of disease. This is a very major uh, disease problem that confronting clinicians. Uh, not a single one of these diagnoses um, was made at the point of clinical presentation. Clinicians actually have very little awareness of diseases such as Q fever, leptospirosis, or brucellosis. Uh, it's probably true to say that veterinarians are more familiar with this because of the impact that they have on livestock. Um, but all of these are linked with livestock. Um, and um, interestingly, um, many of them also have quite important impacts on livestock production. In particular, uh, diseases like brucellosis, Q fever, leptospirosis, uh, and others like Rift Valley fever, uh, to uh, toxoplasmosis, uh, chlamydiosis, also cause reproduction and production losses in livestock. So you're getting this double whammy effect again. Not only are people getting sick directly from either contact with animals or consumption of animal products, um, but they're losing um, important, um, uh, 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 they're suffering important production losses um, through um, abortion events where you lose uh, the next generation of animals as well as um, uh, possible losses to that lactation. So one of the challenges that we face, I'm, I'm sort of moving now from livestock to diseases to, to rabies and other zoonoses, um, but one of the challenges we face is trying to quantify these dual, uh, this dual burden. When we are trying to make the case um, for uh, investment or control of a disease, we need to identify the scale of the disease problem, how that stacks up against other disease priorities in the area, to really justify the use of resources being targeted at these diseases. And one of the problems with the zoonoses is that we have a certain component of disease burden that affects animal health and livestock production, so there's sort of economic um, impacts that can be measured. But then you have a separate set of metrics relating to the human health uh, disease problem, usually years of life lost or dallies or qualies that you may have heard about. And it's quite difficult to bring these together um, to generate a, a sort of a true picture of the overall societal burden of the disease. And, and rabies typifies this as well. Um, and the importance of these metrics came home to me very clearly and the importance of having figures to demonstrate disease burden in order to galvanize and catalyze um, interest and investment um, was has been exemplified very well with the rabies situation. So when I first started working with rabies, it was the first disease I became involved in um, during my PhD. Um, it, the, the World Health Organization used to publish annual surveys that reported about 200 human deaths from rabies in Africa each year. And for those of us working on rabies, it was very apparent that this was a massive um, underestimate of the true burden of disease, but there were no alternative data. Um, even though rabies is a very distinctive human disease, it has terrifying and very distinctive clinical signs, um, very few cases actually get reported to the central authorities um, and to the World Health Organization. And you can imagine trying to make the case for the importance of investing in a disease like rabies when across the whole continent uh, only 200 deaths are reported each year. It can be quite a challenging task. So we decided to start um, using a different set of indicator data. And this is the incidence of animal bite injuries that reported to bite clinics. And in contrast to the human rabies deaths, actually the number of uh, 
people who are bitten by uh, suspected ram rabid animals is quite well documented. And people uh, do recognize uh, the risk of rabies and do present to clinics to receive um, post-exposure vaccination, which is part of the post-exposure prophylaxis, I'm going to call that PP, that is very effective if given very quickly to people bitten by rabid animals in preventing the onset of clinical disease. So we used a sort of developed a probability tree model that used these bite injury data as the starting point. Uh, and you can see the sort of um, records that we would collect from local clinics. They, they, the, the file shown there on the right, it can look a very unpromising set of data, but actually it's yielded some really rich insights. And one message I would give t is uh, to do more with existing data. Things can are often not collected perfectly. We, there are often uncertainties around data that you might collect from the field, um, but they can uh, yield very rewarding insights when um, harnessed with the sort of power of uh, new analytical tools. So in the case of um, uh, this probability tree, we started from the incidence of uh, bite injuries. Uh, we knew from our field data the proportion of rabid dogs that, uh, sorry, suspect rabid dogs um, that were uh, truly rabid, and that was a very high proportion. We know from the animal bite records um, where most of the bite victims are bitten. And this is a really important determinant of whether somebody who's bitten by a rabid animal will actually develop rabies. If you're bitten around the head and neck, uh, there's a much higher risk because it's a highly innervated area. It's very close to the central nervous system. So there's a very high chance that the virus will get taken up by the peripheral nerves and spread to the CNS, and it's at that point that clinical rabies develops um, and uh, the clinical signs appear. And at that point, when clinical signs show, the disease is invariably fatal. So using the distribution of bites uh, on, on patients' bodies, we were able to, to come up with another set of probabilities um, of a person likely to develop clinical disease. And then the final step was to uh, collect data on the proportion of patients who actually received um, PP. And in this case, we used a conservative estimate that anybody getting any form of PP, whatever the interval after the bite, would survive uh, the exposure. And using those data, we came up with figures that indicated that there were likely to be 100 times more rabies deaths than were officially reported in Tanzania. When this was extrapolated to Africa, we find the same conclusion. So there is massive underreporting, and we're able to start coming up now with figures um, that we were able to use that had a, a, a reasonably strong evidence base uh, to, support, uh, to su support our findings. And the more work we've done, the more confident we are that this probability tree approach is uh, generating uh, accurate figures. Um, and work recently carried out by my colleague Katie Hampson from the University of Glasgow extended this to do a re-evaluation of the global rabies burden um, uh, in, in relation, in this case, to uh, dog transmitted rabies. And I should point out here that globally, although we know that rabies can infect many different animal hosts, uh, more than 99% of human deaths worldwide every year um, are caused by dog rabies. Um, and as you can see in this figure, uh, the estimates from Katie and, uh, Katie's analyses show that the focus of the disease problem is in Asia and Africa, and these are areas where rabies is maintained in a cycle involving domestic dogs. So although we have wildlife rabies, and uh, indeed in Grenada, your main problem here is mongoose rabies, in North America, um, cycles are still maintained in, in wild carnivals. Where you see human rabies deaths as a public health problem, um, it's as, always a situation uh, where, which is dominated by domestic dog rabies. Um, and in this analysis, the estimate was of 59,000 people dying of dog-mediated rabies each year. Um, that's really a large number. It's about 150 people dying every day, many of them children um, under 15 years of age who are uh, more likely actually to be bitten by dogs. And when they are bitten, a bitten around their head, head and neck. It's also a very expensive disease. We've uh, most of the cases occurring 
in Asia, but the incidence of disease is highest in Africa. But the reason the costs are so high as well in Asia is because of the very large expenditure on provision of PP to prevent people dying of the disease. So it's, it, it kills a lot of people, but there are a lot of people who require PP in these countries and that comes at a very high cost. And when we think about this figure of 59,000, I, I, I know that you're always hearing about metrics of you know, so many deaths a second or a minute or during a day. Um, but 59,000 is a large number. Um, and when we compare it with um, some of the zoonoses that attract far more attention globally, uh, particularly the emerging zoonoses, uh, you can see that the deaths, even for something as devastating as the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, uh, which killed about 11 to 12,000 people. That's still a lot less than the number of people dying from diseases like rabies every single year. And other diseases like leptospirosis, uh, a global burden of disease study was carried out recently, it also came up with a figure of 59,000. These are not diseases that people would normally be concerned about. And the reason for this is because the endemic zoonoses have limited potential for spread. They don't really affect people in wealthier countries. We have the tools and have already controlled and contained these diseases, so they don't affect us, as I say, the, the wealthy populations in the West. We're, what we're concerned about is the emerging zoonoses, and for very good reasons, because these can often uh, have the potential for pandemic spread. We don't have good tools or vaccines at the moment for prevention control. Um, and these are the diseases that worry us and concern us. But even with that sort of uh, balance of concern, um, we really should be aware of the fact that um, uh, the burden of disease on these endemic zoonoses year in, year out is extremely high. And I think it's something we need to be aware of in terms of thinking about sort of uh, equitability of health interventions at a global level. And this is a case study that I think illustrates quite a lot of the issues associated with rabies and other neglected diseases. Um, you may have heard of rabies in, in your um, lectures being described in sylvatic cycles, I, which refer to wildlife cycles. And I, I mentioned that in terms of North American situation. Or urban rabies, which tends to refer to the domestic dog cycle. But domestic dog rabies is actually much more a disease of rural areas and particularly affects the rural poor. Um, and that's because there are a lot of dogs in these areas. There's a lot of dog rabies. But also because people in poor communities in rural areas are unable to receive uh, appropriate medical care. They can't get to clinics quickly enough. If you live in a city, uh, you have good access to health services. If you're bitten by a suspected rabid dog, you can get to that clinic. And this just illustrates the problems faced by people in some of these more remote areas. This is a family uh, living in a village near the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. Um, it's a mother, she has six children, um, and she recently acquired a puppy, um, and that puppy then developed rabies, and either licked or bit every single one of her children. She recognized rabies uh, when the puppy started to get more and more sick, she recognized the risk that her children were now facing because they'd all been exposed. She knew she had to get them to a clinic very quickly to get the, the vaccine for the PEP treatment. Um, but this imposes quite a cost, the cost of travel, cost of the medical fees, examination fees when she gets to the hospital. And she could only raise enough money to uh, support one of her children going to that clinic. So she was faced with this agonizing dilemma, which child should uh, she take uh, for life-saving treatment. And so while we are often focused on the deaths associated with rabies, that, that it's a horrifying death, it's a horrible death, it's a fatal outcome, um, and those 59,000 deaths each year uh, impose a very real burden. There is this huge sort of bulk of the iceberg effect in terms of the tens of millions of people every year who are bitten by rabid dogs and, and really face uh, a, a kind of race uh, to get the life-saving treatment in time. So there are a lot of sort of complications around um, the preventive prevention of rabies when relying on uh, 
medical treatments and medical interventions alone. Uh, and I think this is illustrated quite well in this figure. It, I'll just take a little bit of time to explain it, but this shows um, in the bars the expenditure on different types of vaccine. We have human PP, so that's the vaccine course that's given when people are exposed to rabbit animals. But there's another arm of prevention for rabies, which is vaccination of the animal source of infection and the animal reservoir, in this case, the domestic dog. So you can see from these global figures that um, everywhere in the world, there's a lot more spent on human PP um, than on dog vaccination. The highest expenditure is currently in Asia, uh, with relatively little investment in dog vaccination. And despite that high investment, um, people are still dying of rabies. And that's because however much you um, invest in that human disease problem, unless you can really tackle the problem at source, i.e. the domestic dogs, there will always be the poorest people in the most vulnerable communities furthest away from the health centers that are going to face difficulties in accessing that treatment and people are going to die. What we see in Latin America is really interesting and gives us a lot of hope because here they're spending quite a lot on PP, but it's a, a lower amount per capita than in Asia. But they're also investing proportionately more, about 20% of the total rabies budget, into mass vaccination of dogs. So they're able to vaccinate about 60% of dogs in Latin America um, compared to much lower coverage um, in Asia. And it's because of that investment in dog vaccination that now Latin America is on the brink of eliminating human rabies deaths from um, uh, dog rabies. Um, and in fact, uh, on the brink also in many areas of uh, entirely eliminating canine rabies. Um, Africa has a way to go on investments in both arms, but even though it's still at an early stage and, and it explains why the incidence is so much higher than anywhere else, what really needs to be advocated at the moment is some um, balance of investment in the PP arms and the dog vaccination arms to ensure that you're really getting um, the disease tackled at source. And this creates what I describe as a sort of safety net. Um, if you can vaccinate dogs and you can really uh, prevent and potentially even eliminate the disease, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter whether you live near a clinic or far from a clinic, you will be protected against rabies. And I think this is an important principle of One Health um, that I think needs to be emphasized that for these reasons, I think it is a much more equitable and in many cases more effective approach than just relying on human medical interventions alone. And I really like the, this uh, set of data from Sri Lanka because it illustrates many of these principles very well. So you see here the uh, number of dog rabies vaccines administered has been steadily increasing um, over the last two decades. Um, and as a result, human rabies deaths have been coming down um, very rapidly. And you might say, well, you know, what's the link? Perhaps that's just more effective use of PEP. PP. And indeed, in the early years, um, a human anti-rabies vaccine, the PP, shown in the pale blue bars here, was also increasing. But what's really encouraging is that we see, with the control of dog rabies that comes with mass dog vaccination, demand for human PP, which is very expensive, is also coming down. And human rabies deaths also continue to decline. And almost every set of data that you look at you see that human deaths track dog rabies incidents. If you can bring dog rabies down, irrespective of what your investments are in human PP, you will prevent and control and eventually eliminate human rabies deaths. So um, rabies has been a focus of a lot of the work that we've been doing. Um, I mentioned that it's a complex multi-host pathogen. It can infect very many different species. But actually, the epidemiology distills often to quite simple principles. Um, but when I started working in Tanzania, we were faced with a widespread perception that there really wasn't any point doing anything about dog rabies because uh, there were so, so many wild animals in Tanzania, so many different potential hosts. And what would be the point of vaccinating dogs if you got continual reinfection from wildlife sources? So we spent a lot of time um, uh, looking at the question of reservoirs, to look at which host populations were sustaining 
cycles of canine rabies virus. And, and really whether wildlife could form a reservoir independently of the dog cycle. And um, I think this picture kind of gives away the story a little bit in advance. It's a really um, unusual situation. It tells you quite a lot about rabies in the Serengeti. First of all, it demonstrates um, one of the key features of the clin clinical features of rabies, which is that of abnormal behavior. It's really not normal for dogs to rush in and start attacking lions. And in fact, you can see how surprised this lion is as a dog's rushing up to him. Uh, actually, the dog got him down the ground, they're kind of rolling around for a while. And in the background, although it's not shown in this photo, were three giraffes, which are kind of standing there, peering down at the situation, um, looking incredibly startled and bemused. So abnormal behavior is a really distinctive sign, whether that's in people in domestic animals, domestic dogs, or, or wild animals. But it also shows a dog uh, potentially infecting a lion, and that directionally, directionality of transmission uh, seems to be the dominant um, path. Um, how did we get to that uh, understanding? Well, a lot of different types of studies trying to identify reservoirs and track down and unravel these infection dynamics is really complicated. Um, it, you can't just say we've got infection species A, therefore it's a reservoir. And you do hear that an awful lot, but you have to be very careful um, because a reservoir implies that this is a host population or a community that is actually sustaining that infection. So you need to look at questions around persistence. So we drew on a lot of different types of approaches, genetic and genomic studies, ecological studies, um, mathematical modeling, case surveillance data. Um, and the upshot of it was uh, we concluded and all these different types of approaches came to a consistent um, uh, conclusion that rabies in the Serengeti, despite the very abundant and diverse wildlife populations, is maintained only by domestic dogs. And that's actually really good news because it means that interventions that are targeted at domestic dogs, and we have excellent vaccines for mass dog vaccination, should result in elimination of rabies from the entire ecosystem. And so um, as part of our research, we uh, set out to tackle this question through large scale interventions of mass dog vaccination. This is a village on the edge of the Serengeti National Park where people are bringing their dogs to vaccination. And I sometimes wonder, you know, how many communities in the world, if you ask people to bring their dogs and maybe 300 dogs pitch up, you'd actually get such a kind of quiet, organized, <laughs> relatively harmonious scene. I, uh, th these are dogs that are really under good control and, and most of them, uh, in fact, virtually all the dogs in these com communities are owned and accessible for vaccination. So this is a location of the villages around the ecosystem where vaccinations were carried out. And the idea was really to create a cordon sanitaire uh, of vaccinated dogs. So removing dogs epidemiologically um, from the ecosystem and then seeing what the outcome was in wild animals. And you do get wild animals throughout these areas. As I mentioned, there are no fences around the Serengeti. Uh, and so you do see wild animals in all these communities and of course, uh, we were also able to document cases of occurring in the park itself. And uh, while it, it, it is quite a challenge, it's quite relatively easy to bring rabies under control. It's actually still quite a challenge to um, eliminate infection entirely, particularly when you've got this sort of design where we have high rates of reinfection, reintroduction from outside um, the vaccinated areas. So uh, this is uh, data taken from the Ngorongora district, which is on the right hand side of the map, showing the rabies cases in uh, dogs in gray and in wildlife in red. Uh, and we started vaccinating um, in these communities in 2003, and there was very rapidly a decline in dog rabies cases. But you can see both in dogs and in wildlife. It wasn't the case that wildlife rabies continued at the same level. Um, and in periods where infection has been eliminated entirely, um, uh, there you see no rabies cases, whether that's dogs or wildlife. When you get dog rabies being reintroduced, for example, there's a peak of cases in 2011, there you also see wildlife rabies coming back. It's not 100% uh, 
uh, uh, compelling, but it, it provides quite strong data. And when combined with our other data on the genetic analyses, um, on the temporal and spatial patterns of disease, we're increasingly confident that um, this conclusion is a strong one um, and that wildlife, while they might experience short chains of transmission as a result of spillover from dogs, um, can't sus sustain it. And since we started the vaccination in 2003, we've actually only had a single case of rabies confirmed in wildlife in the Serengeti. Um, and while obviously surveillance in an area like Serengeti is very difficult, uh, we're very confident that we would have picked up a lot more cases um, uh, if we had sustained transmission in that area. So a very um, optimistic sort of scenario in terms of the wildlife question. We think that um, if we target domestic dogs, we can potentially eliminate the disease. And then there come a lot of operational questions. What level of vaccination coverage do we need? Um, and um, it turns out that uh, this depends on an epidemiological parameter called R0, the basic uh, reproduction number. And this describes how uh, an infection spreads through a population. So if you have a single infected individual uh, in a susceptible population, how many new cases do you see arising from that infected individual? The higher the value of R0, the higher the vaccination coverage you need, and that's shown by that expression on the right side of the graph. Um, and when we look at diseases that have already been eliminated, so the two diseases um, that have been eradicated globally, first smallpox and rinderpest, have values of R0 between about three and five. Diseases that are getting close to eradication, like polio and measles, even higher values of R0. So there's, uh, when we came to look at the rabies, situation, we were actually very encouraged to see that the value of R0 for rabies is very low, between one and two. And all you need to do to control a disease is to bring R0 down below one, um, because the, disease, the infection cannot then sustain itself. So you can see with an R0 of one to two, we're actually already in pretty good shape for rabies. It shouldn't take an awful lot to knock it off um, and, and for us to be able to achieve elimination. And there are many different ways that you can measure R0. Katie Hampson's work has actually generated empirical estimates through detailed contact tracing studies in these communities. Uh, these are direct observations of chains of transmission. And she's found that on average, each rabid dog infects 1.2 other dogs. So that's essentially uh, the value of R0. You can also estimate R0 through epidemic curves. So the higher the increase of cases, the higher the rate of increase of cases, uh, the uh, during an epidemic, the higher the value of R0. And what's really interesting from these data is, again, the consistency of that value of R0. It always falls between value of 1 and 2. And that's regardless of the different uh, type of dog community. You can see there's some high density urban populations, there's very low density rural populations, such as in the Serengeti, and there's high income countries, low income countries. It really doesn't matter wherever people have looked, and there's now a very large body of data to support this. R0 for rabies, canine rabies, falls between one and two. And there's some interesting implications for this. This consistently low value suggests that elimination of canine rabies through vaccination of 70% of dogs should be feasible in most settings. So you don't need to vaccinate all the dogs, you need to vaccinate 70% of dogs if carrying out your vaccination on an annual basis. It also has an important additional corollary, um, and that is that reducing the density of dogs or removing dogs uh, to reduce the population size is unlikely to be effective in controlling rabies. And of course, often uh, in response to rabies epidemic, the first response of authorities is to start killing dogs or, or start removing dogs. And this type of indiscriminate culling is entirely ineffective. Um, it's entirely ineffective because, firstly, as we've shown, the density of dogs doesn't influence rabies transmission very much. You'd have to bring a population of dogs, of, for example, what you see in Bali and in Indonesia of more than 200 dogs per square kilometer down to a value of close to one dog per square kilometer. And that's practically unfeasible. Um, demand for dogs is very high almost everywhere in the world. People like living with dogs um, and people have dogs for a reason. So if their dogs are culled, they're simply going to replace them quite quickly and that can bring disease in. 
but also it means that people quite often move dogs away and hide them uh, to prevent culling and this can also result in spread of disease. And one of the critical points is that when you're trying to do a, a mass dog vaccination campaign and trying to control rabies, what you absolutely need is people on your side. You have to have that community buy-in. And a very um, sort of heavy-handed approach that might involve sort of indiscriminate culling of dogs can often generate animosity and bad will. So there are many reasons why culling of dogs doesn't work. Uh, but in contrast, we know that mass vaccination against rabies is highly effective. Um, and that 70% figure that's predicted by the epidemiological theory on the value on the basis of the R0 values um, is borne out in practice. So it, these are data shown from vaccination campaigns in different communities around Serengeti. Uh, and you can see that where you have high levels of vaccination coverage, there you also no longer get um, outbreaks of rabies. The lower your vaccination coverage, the larger the outbreak size um, uh, is. It also turns out that 70% coverage is the optimal economic scenario in terms of how the campaigns are implemented um, uh, and represent very high, highly cost-effective um, investments in public health terms. So first message, reducing the density of dogs is ineffective. In contrast, mass vaccination of dogs, if you can reach a target coverage of 70%, is highly effective. And a lot of these data have been used really to shape and inform uh, policy uh, at a global level. Um, and in 2015, um, an agreed target was reached by all of the major health agencies, WHO, OIE, FAO, um, that it would be feasible to reach a target of zero human deaths from dog-mediated rabies by 2030. Um, and we're very excited about how the research has contributed um, to, to that policy and, and now this global momentum that's building towards uh, rabies elimination. So in terms of um, One Health interventions, um, many tools do exist for prevention and control of zoonosis at source, um, and, but they simply haven't been deployed very effectively. But if we were to do so, there'd be many benefits. We'd not only reduce the disease burden in people and in animals, um, but these preventive interventions at the animal source provide a much broader safety net um, than if we're relying on clinical management of human cases alone. It's understandable why medical, the medical sector focuses on medical interventions. Um, but I think what One Health can bring to this picture is the idea that, in fact, interventions in the animal population can be uh, as or more effective and certainly more equitable in many cases um, than relying just on human treatment alone. When we're talking about zoonoses, there is only one way to eliminate zoonoses infection. So if we're talking about elimination, we have to talk about interventions in the animal reservoir. And we're also interested in how these interventions can strengthen institutions and health systems more broadly for responding to the challenges of emerging disease threats. And this is just an example of how um, we've been building on the platforms established through the annual rabies vaccinations around the Serengeti, which are well received. They're very popular with communities. There's a very strong level of support and trust between the vaccination teams and the communities. And we're using that now um, to build uh, more integrated programs involving both veterinary and medical practitioners um, in in delivering a, a wider range of interventions. And here you can see uh, a program where we were combining dog vaccination on the left with deworming of children against soil transmitted helmets um, on the right. Um, and this trust, the intersectoral cooperation between the med medics and the vets, um, community engagement, these are all critical features in any um, report or review of some of the challenges faced during the Ebola uh, epidemic, for example, you'll see these features coming up time and time again. So if we can build these relationships, these interconnections that I talked about right at the beginning through One Health, um, we're already quite a long way towards um, addressing some of the and, and uh, helping to uh, cope with some of the global health challenges that we face. And I, I've always been quite interested in this quote that came from a study of um, zoonosis from the World Bank, uh, one health study. Um, and, and this has been very much the prevailing narrative that if you can establish a global 
uh, surveillance system for emerging infectious diseases with pandemic potential, then the spillover benefits uh, can accrue uh, to addressing the endemic diseases that are priority for developing countries. And, and you can see a rationale behind that, a big investment in avian influenza or SARS or Ebola, and you'll get these spillover benefits for some of the more neglected zoonoses. But I actually think that's really the wrong way to be thinking about it. I think we need to turn this on its head a bit more and consider that a more effective global surveillance system can be established if we start by focusing on a locally relevant disease problem, a disease that's a priority in the developing countries where many of these emerging diseases arise. And we can start to build the systems, build the response networks, get the uh, sectors working effectively together. And then if there is an emerging disease problem, um, we have the systems more effectively in place to, to manage that. Um, so that was the end of the section on zoonoses. And uh, Dr. Badezi, I just wondered, I'm taking longer than I thought, and I just mm -hmm. wondered if I should just carry on? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, and actually, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about non-zoonotic diseases is Dr. Badezi's talk at the conference yesterday was he, he, he referred to a blind spot and zoonosis being the blind spot of One Health, where sometimes we tend to only think about zoonosis as diseases of relevance for One Health. So the next three examples I'm giving are all non-zoonotic diseases, um, but they do relate importantly to aspects of ecosystem health and sort of broad societal and political issues that are uh, uh, along with it. I'm going to start by talking about rinderpest, which I've all already mentioned as one of the only diseases that's been eradicated in the world along with smallpox. Um, but it's a disease that's had enormous uh, repercussions in Africa following its introduction in the late 19th century. It's, it's really impossible to understand the social political history of Africa without reference to rinderpest. It caused massive mortality in livestock, in wildlife, it caused famine, huge social upheaval, disruptions, um, migrations, um, and it was really catastrophic across the whole continent. But in the Serengeti itself, it's also a really interesting pathogen because the whole of the ecosystem has really been shaped by the rinderpest virus. So although when you're thinking of the Serengeti, I'm sure many of you probably have images of vast herds of wildebeest, sort of elephants, uh, lions, uh, leopards, and all the sort of charismatic megavertebrates. But for me, the keystone species, the most critical species in the whole of the Serengeti has been the rinderpest virus. Um, and that's because rinderpest affects wildebeest, and the Serengeti ecosystem itself is defined by the movements of wildebeest. Uh, the boundaries of the ecosystem are, ha were, um, uh, are sort of ecologically defined by the extent of the wildebeest migration, which in involves an annual cycle, um, including uh, areas in Kenya, the Masai Mara Game Reserve, and, and also in Tanzania. And what was seen in the early uh, sorry in the 50s and 19, uh, 1960s is a much lower population of wildebeest than we have at the, at the present time. So there are only about 200,000 wildebeest in the Serengeti at that time. The big change and the big shift perturbation to the ecosystem occurred with the introduction of rinderpest vaccination in cattle. And this was introduced as part of a global eradication campaign. It wasn't uh, considered to really have any relevance for the Serengeti at all. But it had huge repercussions because it released uh, wildebeest from the spillover transmission uh, of rinderpest. So annual um, mortality from yearlings from rinderpest spread from cattle was always very high when you had rinderpest circulating. As soon as vaccination was implemented, um, uh, these uh, uh, the wildebeest numbers shot up and reached the carrying capacity of about 1.5 million where they are today. So control of rinderpest in cattle led to a five-fold increase in wildebeest. It's pretty amazing actually to think that, that I wonder there are probably no other ecosystems in the world where we now have five times of, as many uh, vertebrate species um, of, of one species than there were in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and because wildebeest are such important species in the ecosystem, there have been major impacts on ecosystem dynamics from fire dynamics, uh, predator-prey dynamics, vegetation dynamics, and even carbon cycling. So a huge 
uh, perturbation um, uh, that's affected, tro uh, really sort of instigated a, a major trophic cascade. Uh, but when we're thinking about sort of the power of interventions, even though uh, the Rinderpest vaccination of cattle was not designed as an intervention to test hypotheses about Rinderpest reservoirs, what it did demonstrate unequivocally is that wildlife were not reservoirs of Rinderpest. This wasn't clear at the time of the intervention. There's quite a lot of discussion about whether, just as we've heard for rabies, if you vaccinated cattle, it would be relatively futile because you'd simply get reintroduction from wildlife on a continual basis. But even with the very large populations of uh, wild herbivores and susceptible herbivores in the park, um, it turns out that wildlife are not reservoirs. Once cattle were vaccinated, as I say, in the late 50s and 1960s, here you can see infection levels in both buffalo and wildebeest declining um, and then eventually disappearing. So just as the case with rabies, infection cycles just couldn't be sustained. And this was a scene seen again later in, in the early 1980s when there was a, uh, a subsequent outbreak. At this time, there was an even larger population of wildebeest, so you might have expected circulation to be sustained. But just as in the earlier situation, um, uh, while there was initial spillover from cattle because of that outbreak, once it was contained in cattle, then uh, infection died out um, in wildlife as well. So very powerful uh, insights that are gained from that vaccination intervention. Um, and as you probably are aware, rinderpest has now been declared eradicated in 2011. It's a major um, achievement for the veterinary profession. It's had huge impacts um, for food security, trade, manufacturing incomes. And Sir Walter Plowright, who um, developed the vaccine initially, uh, was awarded the World Food Prize in 1999 in recognition of these uh, global um, impacts. Um, but there are some interesting situations now. We've removed one uh, morbillivirus, virus, rinderpest is in this morbillivirus virus family, um, which is also where measles sits. But there's another disease, Peste Petit Ruminant, a PPR, which, as its name suggests, affects small ruminants rather than cattle. Um, and that's now actually spreading um, in many parts of Africa where it wasn't previously, but is also now a target for eradication. So the success of Rinderpest has really uh, provided encouragement that PPR can also be eradicated. And uh, we were quite interested in the idea of sort of host switching for morbilliviruses. We know that um, this is a group of viruses that can jump across the species barrier quite easily. Um, and we looked at um, cattle samples, which and cattle are not typically supposed to be infected with PPR, and tested some of the cattle that were alive during the initial PPR outbreak when infection first came into northern Tanzania, and found that quite a high proportion were zero positive to PPR virus uh, and had been infected. Um, so we know that this virus isn't as simple as it might appear, i.e. Uh, confined to small ruminants. It can definitely infect cattle. We don't know whether cattle can transmit the disease. We don't know whether it causes uh, disease in cattle. We don't know whether there is any potential for cattle to be reservoirs and therefore jeopardize PPR eradication. But I do think it's actually very useful um, as a tool for surveillance because once mass vaccination of sheep and goats is carried out, uh, we will still be able to track circulating infection by looking at cattle. Um, and just to note that there are uh, other morbilliviruses uh, in the ecosystem that are also showing the propensity to cross host species. Um, and working with Brian Willett, a colleague at the University of Glasgow, who has developed um, what's known as pseudotype assays that can now distinguish the seroreactivity among these different morbilliviruses. Um, and can very specifically indicate whether this is a uh, this sera is reactive to PPRV or to other morbidity viruses such as CDV, canine distemper virus, or measles. And indeed confirm the finding that cattle can be infected with PPRV, but interestingly also canine distemper virus, which as its name suggests, you wouldn't expect normally uh, to be present in, um, in cattle. But it's also unmasked probably um, an another uh, morbidity virus which we terming atypical bovine morbillivirus that has probably been circulating all along in cattle and um, that shows some seroreactivity 
uh, to the rinderpest virus. Um, and it's going to be important for us to track down um, that virus and try and identify and characterize it. So an interesting question about whether eradicating one pathogen has led to new ec ecological niches emerging. Another very important livestock disease that you'll have all heard about is foot and mouth disease in Africa. Um, in Africa, it has a fairly complex epidemiology because there are at least five strains of the virus that can circulate. And the critical feature here that distinguishes African FMD from other parts of the world is that there are these South African territory, the SAT strains, that can be maintained in Buffalo. And in order to control foot and mouth disease, in Southern Africa particularly, the approach has been to try and separate buffalo from cattle, to, to create these disease-free zones that allow then export of beef to lucrative um, export markets. And, and actually a lot of the ecology of Southern Africa has been shaped in an, an, uh, and often to the detriment of the ecology of the areas, um, affected by the construction of these uh, game, veterinary game fences uh, across the landscape. So there's been a lot of questions about whether um, we, with the increasing value of wildlife through ecotourism, for example, this is actually uh, an appropriate form of land use and a way to manage ecosystems overall. You're protecting the beef export market, but it may come at a high environmental and ecological cost. And in East Africa, where I mentioned there are no fences, um, uh, and there's no control of food and mouth at all. We were interested really to see what was the role of buffalo um, in FMD epidemiology. And is this something that we'd have, we'd have to worry about and what might be possible control options for FMD? And as you can see from the map, there are uh, very large uh, populations of buffalo across Africa, again, shown by the livestock distribution living in close proximity to cattle. Um, at the moment, not separated uh, by game fences. And we carried out a number of surveys looking at infection in livestock and buffalo. We found high levels of infection across cattle, sheep, goats, and buffalo. But the question is how related were these infection patterns? Um, just to note that in, in, in this study, we also looked at some of the impacts of foot and mouth outbreaks. And while Conventionally, many people think that foot and mouth isn't really a problem for indigenous cattle, and it's only really an economic issue for high intensive production systems. Um, in fact, the disease has uh, enormous consequences because these cattle still lose their milk production, and, and that means that families will go hungry, they don't have milk, um, and, and that can last for several weeks. Uh, if animals are lame, they can't get to grazing. Um, and so there are a lot of knock-on consequences um, that we found, and, and it was a disease that is of great concern to pastoralists. So not insignificant just because they're not high-yielding dairy cows. Um, but what we found when we looked at risk factors for both foot and mouth disease infection and outbreaks were that the risks were dominated very much by livestock management factors. Um, particularly high risk in pastoral and agro-pastoral farming systems um, linked uh, to some degree with movements of animals and particularly the introduction and the rate of introduction of new animals. What we didn't find was any association at all uh, with wildlife. So whether that was distant wildlife protected areas, frequency of sighting of buffaloes, for example. And looking at the serological data from buffalo and cattle, buffalo differed from cattle in terms of their uh, serotype specific patterns of infection. So they didn't appear to be closely linked cycles. Um, and drawing on data from uh, different outbreaks and um, FMD isolates uh, reported uh, from across the East African region, what we see is a, a, a pattern of uh, sort of epidemic sweeps of distinct serotypes. So you, this is shown probably most clearly in this probability uh, density plot shown below, um, that you'll have an epidemic that sweeps across the region of first of all, perhaps SAT1, followed by O, followed by SAT2, and then followed by the A virus. Um, and that all of these outbreaks are driven by livestock, even the SAT viruses, uh, those epidemics are driven by livestock management factors, not by wildlife. And um, from some of the vaccine matching studies that have been done, it's shown that um, with these particular serotypes coming through, the existing vaccine strains are likely to be effective for cattle vaccination. 
And where does this leave us all with what to do about foot and mouth in East Africa? Well, um, we talked about the sort of uh, the default assumption that the way to control and deal with foot and mouth disease is to build fences and to separate wildlife and livestock. But the ecosystems of East Africa are in entirely dependent on movement. Both the movement of wild animals and pastoral systems and the productivity of pastoral systems is dependent on the move movement of cattle. So mobility is absolutely at the heart um, of the productivity of these landscapes. Um, and building game fences um, would have huge ecological and economic implications. But the results of our finding are important because they show that we don't need game fences as a strategy for controlling FMD in its endemic state and the situation that we have now that we can control the burden of disease through strategies involving vaccination of cattle that are likely to be a much more effective option. Um, and then finally very quickly and I'm sorry that I'm talking for so long um, but I it's, uh, wanted to pick up some of these themes through a disease called malignant catarrhal fever. This is another important disease of livestock, particularly for pastoralists. Um, it's caused by a gamma herpes virus infection that's transmitted from wildebeest to cattle. It's asymptomatic in wildebeest, um, but causes a fatal infection um, to cattle. Uh, and the highest risk for cattle is as a result of transmission from wildebeest calves up to about three months of age. And the problem arises because of the annual cycle of the wildebeest. Um, if you look at the map on the left, this shows locations of different radio-collared wildebeest, but in the paler green uh, where the arrow is shown, these are the areas known as the short grass plains where the wildebeest come for their calving period. They carve in a, a very tight uh, two-week period with synchronized calving. You can see the very similar size and age of calves uh, in that landscape. And they come to these areas because they're extremely rich in the minerals needed for lactation, calcium and phosphorus. Um, highly productive grazing lands and the perfect environment uh, for lactating females. But they're also the perfect environment um, for cattle. And this is now outside the National Park. These are areas settled by Maasai pastoralists. These are grazing lands that pastoralists need uh, to allow their cattle to recover condition after the dry season, but they can't use them at all at this time of year because the very high risk of transmission of MCF. So they're forced to push uh, their cattle up into the sort of unproductive highland areas. They suffer a high burden of other disease problems there, tick-borne diseases. Um, the nutrition is very poor in the grasslands in those areas. Um, and so they're uh, severe implications for livestock production. There are other consequences if you have to move your cattle away. Um, not only are the cattle um, not regaining body condition uh, as effectively, but it means you're moving your animals away from the principal household residence, which is where children are because they now are more sedentary and going to school. Uh, and children, the most important source of protein for children is milk. And if cattle are moved away again, children, the milk from those animals is unavailable um, for the family. Um, milk is, it's, uh, the wet season, this would be the time when you might expect to see more milk uh, available for income uh, and not being able to sell those, uh, uh, sell that milk is also a major impact on household incomes. So a lot of these indirect repercussions from the fact of you're having to move to avoid MCF. And on the landscape more broadly, we see MCF as one of a suite of diseases that really has an impact on livestock productivity. And as a pastoralist, if you're unable to survive on livestock, these are populations traditionally that are entirely reliant on livestock, but we're seeing shifts in this because livestock productivity cannot keep up with human demand. And so what are the alternatives? The alternative food sources have to be found, and that means a, a switch to crop-based agriculture. So what's the problem with that, you might say? Well, the, there are problems for these semi-arid range, rangelands and the important buffer areas around national parks. The map here shows the Tarangiri ecosystem with the national park in green. And you can see the enormous increases in the areas under crop-based cultivation shown in the red. At the same time, a decline 
in the wildlife populations and the dispersal routes of wildlife in those areas. And I think it's illustrated quite well by the picture on the left, that the zebra would tolerate cattle and livestock very well, but certainly doesn't tolerate mechanized agriculture to the same degree. So livestock production loss is not just a problem for the livelihoods and health of pastoralists. It's important for the integrity of these ecosystems. The best form of land use um, is a mixed uh, livestock uh, wildlife system based around traditional pastoralism. So we were interested to see whether uh, the development of an MCF vaccine might help support coexistence. And we ran this field trial inoculating cattle with an experimental vaccine that had been developed in the UK and challenging these cattle by uh, moving them into very close proximity with wildebeest uh, and wildebeest calves, which is something that you would never normally see happen. This would absolute anathema to Maasai pastoralists. They, they, they see it as um, a, a almost impossibly difficult thing to do to actually herd beloved cattle into, into the line of fire of, of these very dangerous wildebeest calves. Um, and we monitored clinical signs of disease and um, uh, serum samples for antibody testing. And what was the outcome? Well, we found no adverse effects of the vaccine, which was good news, and also high levels of virus-specific and virus-neutralizing antibodies, both in nasal secretions and in plasma. But we only found partial protection against natural infection, about 50%, sorry, 56% efficacy. And interestingly, one of the reasons we, uh, this, uh, it was quite difficult to interpret these data is that we were anticipating quite high levels of fatal infection in the non-vaccinated animals. And in fact, we didn't find that. And that raises a whole lot of other questions about what might have been uh, modulating factors uh, protecting cattle against that fatal infection. Um, subsequent studies in Kenya have shown higher levels of efficacy. Um, and overall, we think that there is quite a lot of promise in using this vaccine, but I think it does raise some interesting questions. So how are we going to best deploy this vaccine? And we're just undertaking a series of stakeholder consultation um, workshops to try and uh, discuss with Maso, first of all, to present these results, but also to discuss how and where and whether this vaccine could be most effectively deployed. So it probably is useful if cattle can't be moved away, if you're unable to avoid MCF because there's no longer any available grazing lands. And increasingly that's the case in, in Kenya, for example, or you need to keep some of your animals at the permanent residence to provide food for your family. Then you have nothing to lose really. It's a safe vaccine and you will protect most of your animals. But the real question is, is it sufficient protection to actually result in uh, completely changing grazing patterns uh, to be able to be released from this need to move away from the high productive grazing lands at the time of wildebeest carving. So we don't know the answer to that, but it's a very interesting ecosystem health question. Um, it raises some uncertainties about the impact of uh, uh, higher levels of coexistence between pastoralists and, and wildebeest. Is there going to be competition for grazing? Um, is there going to be more livestock predation and human wildlife conflict, for example? Um, and it does. It is something that makes conservationists quite nervous. But I believe that if this can be managed effectively, it provides a, a great opportunity for sustaining an integrated multiple use area that we know is going to be the most um, uh, effective in supporting the integrity of the entire ecosystem, the health of wild animals, the health of domestic animals, and ultimately the health of people. Um, so just to conclude, um, I hope it's been clear from this presentation that One Health is uh, not just about connections, but uh, critically about partnerships. We need partnerships to understand these complex diseases, their burdens and their impacts and their implications. One Health interventions can generate more effective and more equitable benefits for human health um, than approaches that rely exclusively on treatment or medical approaches um, for human disease. We need to be aware of the rapid transitions that are occurring. Things are changing all the time. Uh, infection dynamics and disease risk are changing. Um, and this has important implications for how we might be thinking about interventions. 
but ultimately we need to try and adopt this sort of big picture approach so that interventions in complex um, livestock wildlife systems need to think about optimizing ecosystem health outcomes overall rather than focusing on one particular outcome perhaps at the detriment of another um, and ultimately in, in how we can optimize delivery of sustainable development goals. So thank you all very much um, for listening. I just wanted to mention very briefly uh, many collaborators on the work that we've done, a great team of people working on the rabies research uh, projects over the years, our crack team uh, working on MCF vaccine in the field, um, uh, and uh, a large collaborative team tackling the very complex question of foot and mouth dis disease. And I think this exemplifies the need for, we have economists on this team, virologists, ecologists, mathematical modelers, um, and um, uh, to really understand these disease problems and to understand the implications of different interventions, you need these interdisciplinary teams. And as you might expect, this has all required funding from quite a number of different sources. I, I started with a slide of my of the main collaborators that are uh, institutions I work with, which span animal and human health as well as uh, wildlife research. And this is also reflected in the funding support that I've received. So thank you very much for your time. And I'd be very happy to discuss things further, clarify any points, um, and uh, answer any questions to the best that I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cleveland. That was actually a very interesting conversation because it demonstrates specifically the interaction between humans, animals, and the environment. I mean, how much more direct you can get. Essentially, people die from rabies. Yeah. And to solve that problem, you have to vaccinate dogs. Well, th theoretically, you yeah. could solve the problem if you just invested very effectively into human PP. Mm -hmm. I mean, theoretically, you can mm -hmm. do that. that that's what's so essentially, yeah. but yeah. it's it's extremely expensive. Yeah. Uh, and it only works if you can guarantee that all of the people who are exposed can mm -hmm. get to the clinic yeah. within 24 hours. Yeah. So it, it actually relates back to the socioeconomic status of different populations. It works fine for people in cities. And one of the challenges we face with getting um, sort of increased political support for rabies is that actually if you're well off, you live in a city, yeah. i.e. probably you're a politician, <laughs> um, you know you're never going to really experience the consequences of not being able to get yeah. uh, rabies PEP in time. It was also fascinating to see for example how animals or, or herds of animals physically changes the landscape mm -hmm. and their presence of, or absence Yes. will impact the, the ecosystem. Yes, and I was uh, toying, you'll be pleased to hear I didn't put those slides in because I was thinking <laughs> I might just slip them in. I have a series of slides that demonstrates uh, uh, the trophic mm -hmm. cascade that arises from rinderpest vaccination. Mm -hmm. And it's a fascinating story. I mean, just very briefly, the increase in wildebeest numbers has led to an increase in, in lion numbers, for example. That's had knock-on negative repercussions for some of the smaller carnivores like cheetahs and African wild dogs. The increase in wildebeest has resulted in reduced um, burning because of the trampling and the reduction in the uh, amount of um, fuel for fires. That's led to growth in woody vegetation. So you've seen massive vegetation changes um, over the last 30 years. And actually now, overall, that's resulted in Serengeti becoming a carbon sink rather than a carbon source. So, uh, there are many others I could tell you about, but it, it, it's, it would have been almost impossible to have predicted that. And I'm sure nobody was even talking about it at the time mm -hmm. of cattle vaccination. We, mm -hmm. We've been able to document it subsequently, but it does illustrate that interventions can definitely have unforeseen consequences yeah. and monitoring those interventions is really important if they're likely to impact on some of these important conservation areas. And certainly Rinda is probably one of the most successful stories we, we have been able to, to achieve uh, as humanity. Yes, I mean, it's a, a fantastic achievement. Um, and as I say, there is now a, a big sort of global push to try and repeat this for PPR. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, we also think that wildlife are not reservoirs for PPR. There have been isolates of the virus from different mm -hmm. wildlife populations, but we suspect that this pattern will uh, uh, 
hold true for PPR. I think the question of cattle is interesting. We're doing some ongoing research now um, just to see sort of what the consequences of cattle infection is, both clinically and, and in terms of onward spread. Uh, because if cattle are able to maintain these cycles, then we're into a different scenario altogether. But let's keep our fingers crossed that it's just yeah. confined to sheep and goats. <laughs> it's, uh, well, with everything interconnected, yes, you know, it's, the, the potential is always there. Yes, Most and I think, involved, yeah, you know? and these morbillia viruses are really interesting because of their propensity to jump mm -hmm. host species. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I was involved in Serengeti in a big outbreak of canine distemper in lions. And that was the first time we were aware that it could cause this sort of level of mortality in free-ranging lines. It's, you know, canine distemper. When I was at vet school, I learned about it. It's a disease primarily of domestic dogs and maybe, you know, wild canids here and there. Not lions, but it killed about a thousand lions in Serengeti. And that was a jump from domestic dogs to lions. Um, and now we've seen distemper actually in cattle as well. So these are viruses that uh, we shouldn't pigeonhole and we shouldn't we should be definitely open minded when we're learning about these pathogens yeah. that things change sure. so don't expect the unexpected because we're seeing different patterns of contact different epidemiologies mm -hmm. different drivers and um, kind of vulnerabilities yeah. for infection and, and I think uh, that's how emerging diseases are kind of exactly. occurring exactly and as people encroach more and more into these environments that's so it was habitats for wildlife with the pathogens that they carry. The exposure potential for humans certainly increases as well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 John, just so I'm checking in, if anyone online has any questions, any, any comments to make? Uh, it's still pretty light on the question front, but um, I'd like to step in and just say there was an interesting conversation. I'd like to hear a little bit, Dr. Cleveland, if you have time, about how you got into this kind of research. Kind yeah. Of um, by accident. Just to say to anybody out there, you know, uh, I think it's all about sort of, um, t making the most of opportunities. In fact, my opportunities came about through things that would have been considered quite negative. Um, I failed to get two jobs at critical times in my life. <laughs> and then I also had a period of bad health, which meant I left veterinary practice and went into a more sedentary work um, as a research assistant. But yes, I went to Serengeti um, because I failed to get a job <laughs> uh, on the British Antarctic Survey uh, and started working on cheetahs um, and ec the ecology of cheetahs. Uh, but then got involved at the time there was a very devastating outbreak of rabies in African wild dogs, which is a, a very endangered carnivore in the Serengeti. And that just then stimulated my whole interest. So I, I wasn't long out of vet school and I thought, surely we know everything there is to know about rabies. You know, <laughs> Louis Pasteur, a hundred years ago, he's, you know, what don't we know about rabies? And it turns out there's quite a lot we don't know about rabies, um, and particularly in these sorts of environments. So that just got me on that track and I did a PhD and never really intended to pursue an academic path, but yeah, just rabies kept me going, drawing me in. And I think the rest of uh, the research that I've done has been really in response to the problems that we see in these communities. Um, obviously, to get research done, there's got to be a combination of identifying a researchable question and then convincing uh, somebody to give you funding to do it. But the ideas that I have almost always come from conversations with people in the community. So, you know, the foot and mouth research, I was hearing time and time again, foot and mouth is really important for us. Uh, when I go back to the UK, I talk about foot and mouth in Africa, says, oh, it's not important in Africa. Nobody's ever going to fund that. It's of no relevance at all. Animals get a bit sick, but they don't die. It doesn't matter. Um, but with sort of some perseverance, the same with MCF, trying to highlight the problems that I'm hearing from the grassroots level, uh, there's almost always researchable questions there that have interesting routes to impact. And actually the disease I talked about early on, the senioriasis, the tapeworm disease, I'm actually just writing a grant proposal today to, to try and get more funding to look at that because we think there are some really immediate interventions we could implement that would have enormous impact. So it's about opportunities and um, identifying those opportunities, following your interests, but being responsive as well to what the 
priorities are of sort of populations really in need. I agree. I agree with that. And we always encourage our students and colleagues that it's always important to align your work with the with the trends and, and priority areas that are around because that way you can be able to access mm. not only the people but the resources as well associated with that particular work. Yeah. Mm. I'm interested to find out how how the the local communities, even the native tribes, for example, they respond and participate in this work because I will believe that the success of any of these projects will be dependent on, on the buy-in mm -hmm. and, and the participation on the, on the part of the local communities. So um, I started with dogs, um, which are not a high priority mm -hmm. species. Yeah. And it was actually quite a good place to start because mm -hmm. um, I wasn't really threatening. I, I was just sort of completely weird and bizarre. And, and people were incredibly kind and generous because Tanzanians are very tolerant of weird, bizarre people. <laughs> so so um, uh, and, and that was actually a very good entry point. But as you start working on livestock, I mean, this is the absolute heart of the culture of people's, as I mentioned, the core of the being. And it's, it's, it's true to say that, uh, particularly cattle, these are revered animals. It's a completely different relationship to we, the it's one we wealth have. as well. So wealth, it's a, yeah. I, I can't put it as too strongly, it's really a love. Yeah. And that's why, in fact, there was so much disquiet when we were running the vaccine trial mm -hmm. and taking these beloved animals, even though that I'd actually purchased them, they were my cows. Mm -hmm. They almost refused to let us take them to the, the, the reason, connections yeah, they have yeah. because of the risk. So you're working with something that people care about deeply. And sometimes I felt we haven't gone far enough towards an intervention that will generate a benefit. But there's such a thirst and quest for knowledge and information. They really want to know everything about these animals. They want to know about these diseases. Mm -hmm. And so the most critical thing of any research is the feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to come back with results. Even if you don't have the results ready yet, you need to go back and say, We're, this is the general finding, these are our general conclusions. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have that feedback and that continued uh, interaction with the community, actually you're really welcome. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an amazing place to research, but that is absolutely critical. I think it's not just the helicopter approach where you just hover over and you yeah. leave. Yeah. Um, is being on the ground, yeah. being there. Um, and as I say in this last trip two weeks ago, new ideas, aware of a new problem. That's something we can very quickly provide information that immediately people will be able to implement interventions themselves. And so those kinds of interaction are really rewarding. They're very important for the research program mm -hmm. because we are welcome. Um, and um, I, people understand the reasons why we're doing it, even if we don't always have all the answers, yeah. and even if you know we can't magically produce foot and mouth vaccines for the whole world, you know, yeah. it's, um, I think there's a good understanding of what we're trying to do. When we think about health, the, the purest definition of health describes health as physical, mental, and social well-being. So when we think about these local communities, the idea of the interactions with animals has has impact on both their physical, their mental, and of course social well-being mm. as well. Yeah. So it impacts health at, at, at the purest of its definition. Yes, yes. I, I think it absolutely does. And I, for me, it, it's there is no question about one health in, in these communities. Yeah. I mean, you can't avoid thinking in that way. And I think one reason there's a lot of leadership from Africa and African scientists in one health, and I think that's because people are living so closely yeah. with animals that is such an immediate connection. Many in our society are pretty divorced from those yeah. steps, from where your food is coming from, you know, the animals mm -hmm. that go into it, how the animals are interacting with the land. We don't really see that. Mm -hmm. Whereas in these environments, um, you feel it on a day-to-day -day basis. So One Health just makes absolute intuitive sense um, as a way to do business, really. A lot of this work, though, it <clears throat> seems across national borders. For example, that all of these countries are landlocked countries. Yeah. I mean, animals migrate across countries, for example. How does governments in these regions manage not just the animals themselves, but these projects? Mm. Because there's a lot of geopolitical yeah. issues that's involved here. Well, I think international coordination is mm -hmm. absolutely fundamental, particularly when you're talking about elimination campaigns. Yeah. And wherever you 
see the residual problems are often at the borders. It's a really interesting phenomenon. So elimination of fox rabies in Europe, it was always hovering yeah. around the you know, French-German border and the, you know, the, the Swiss-German border. <laughs> it's always those borders. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so it's, it's very true in Latin America, I talked about the huge successes with rabies, very close to rabies elimination there. And that's really been achieved because of this effective coordination internationally. And they've been able to they have very good networks um, and to use also sort of the positive peer pressure among different countries to try and uh, reach the goals of elimination. So it is really important. I think for the um, endemic diseases that are more localized, it's probably less of an issue. But certainly when you're talking about foot and mouth disease, um, which can spread very easily across yeah. borders um, and diseases like rabies, when we get into the point of elimination, it's going to be really critical. Uh, it's, it's also important to note that the team that you work with, it's a, it's a multidisciplinary approach yes. and, and participation and involvement. Mm -hmm. um, is that easier to accomplish in a developing country context mm. as opposed to develop the reason I'm asking. Yeah, no, it's a good question. <laughs> is because sometimes when you have specialized centers and academic yeah. and academic communities, everyone seems to be very defined and confined yes. within their their own strengths and within yeah. their professions or silos, that is. Yeah. But somehow, at least the ease in which you presented your work, it seems to be very natural yeah. to have this diverse cadre of professionals. So I'm asking is it easy or was that difficult? Um, I think it's easier uh, yeah. and I think it's a combination of different factors. I think there is a question about increasing specialization mm -hmm. um, and I think particularly on the medical profession, even mm -hmm. across different sort of branches of medical profession, it's quite hard for people to interact actually. Mm -hmm. You quite quickly get yeah. channeled into your specialization. So I'd say that sort of for our type of medical system, that's a, it is a real issue. And interestingly, the One Health collaborations with medics in, in Tanzania has been a lot easier mm -hmm. than sort of trying to engage with that um, from, from the UK side. Mm -hmm. And that's nothing to do with any kind of question of antagonism yeah. or yeah. You know, competition. It's, mm -hmm. it's simply, I think, because of these institutional structures mm -hmm. and disciplinary structures. Um, but there are, but we have um, sort of conversely also had extremely uh, productive interactions with social scientists. That's been great, and and again maybe sort of vets and social scientists work well together because both of us, in some sense, are more generalists than perhaps yeah. the medical profession. I think you made the point in your presentation. Yeah. Medics deal with a single species. That's right. yeah. um, vets, of course, by definition, don't. So already we're recognizing that there's a world beyond a single species. Um, social scientists almost invariably are looking at um, multiple forms and the spectrum. Um, we've had very effective interactions with economists, although I find it quite hard to understand economists. <laughs> but they do, they're terribly patient and try to explain to things and what's going on. <laughs> but yeah. very useful. Um, useful for looking at impacts of cost effectiveness studies, things like ec economic sorry, econometric analyses at household level to look at these impacts, willingness to pay studies. All of these you really need economic um, specialization. Any interdisciplinary working really depends on the individual. And the individual's got to want to embrace that because it's not easy. We speak different languages, we do things differently. And those individuals need to recognize the benefits of working together yeah. that can offset some of the challenges that we all face sure. doing that. Um, so it does depend on having open-minded individuals who can also see the research interest. So one of my worries about economists is the sorts of questions that we want to ask are not really interesting academic questions. Right. Yeah, <laughs> They're kind of practical yeah. health economics, you know, yeah. uh, and probably really dull for most, mm -hmm. you know, high-flying mm -hmm. um, economists. Mm -hmm. So it's finding a person who sees the interest and the value and the academic value in that yeah. to, to, to bring yeah. on board. Yeah. Um, I, I've always find it a bit difficult. Um, my area, of course, is also in infectious diseases, particularly zoonoses. But when you present that to, let's say, governmental funding agencies, for example, from a population health perspective, mm. we are competing with the chronic diseases, yeah. where the top five causes of morbidity and mortality are chronic diseases, your heart disease, mm. 
it's your metabolic disorders, it's your cancers, it's, mm -hmm. it's your strokes, for example. How how easy or difficult is it to present your nature of work for funding, for support, mm -hmm. in the era of which chronic diseases is, mm -hmm. is the main population burden that we face? Well, I think it's challenging for a number of reasons and even in the pre sort of NCD era it's, mm -hmm. it's been challenging because of this invisibility yeah. um, issue. Um, all I can say is that we keep chipping away at it and of course we've been able to um, leverage funding on for zoonoses uh, mm -hmm. largely because of the emerging disease threats mm -hmm. that are so closely linked with zoonoses. Um, Again, in my mind, that's a slightly double-edged sword because I don't think we should be thinking about them in such distinct policy domains that you know, there are some very common themes around zoonoses and, and tackling them. Um, so I, I think um, we're all, we all kind of adapt to the, the there are shifting priorities. Yeah. There are some really interesting questions around the intersection between NCDs and endemic infectious diseases mm -hmm. as well. Um, but I think it is a struggle, and particularly when you're dealing with diseases, you know, like Q fever that people haven't really heard of. I think Q fever is going to turn out to be a really important disease. We've already seen it. It's you know, about 5% of febrile patients in hospital. That's quite a lot of disease, a, a serious disease, yeah, um, uh, due to Q fever. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there are interventions, there are potential vaccines that could be used. Um, but I can't imagine successfully writing a grant application just now that would compete in a global health call for that. So we're quite lucky in the UK. We've had some very um, focused initiatives around zoonotic diseases mm -hmm. and um, infectious diseases of livestock in international con yeah. development context. Mm -hmm. And now we have quite a lot of development funding coming for research. So. We're relatively well served in the UK at the moment, but um, of course it's yeah it's a challenge, and and you don't want to get into this sort of I don't like this sort of competition. You know, my disease is more exactly. important than your disease. Exactly. <laughs> but, but you made a really but, point yeah. because if your sources are focusing on on development, because your disease is I mean directly impacting the, the development potential mm. of communities of the environment of, of yeah. societies as well. So it's not just looking at these diseases from an infectious mm. disease perspective, but it's impact and implications yeah. on society. And I think that's where looking at the sustainable development goals more broadly are really mm. important. I mean, we tend to see if people have gone to the SDG websites, you kind of get this menu yeah. um, of, of the 17 goals. Mm. And you, you know, you kind of feel you can pick and choose. I'm going to deal with this one. And so I'm going to deal, I yeah. tackle this goal or this target. But these goals themselves are so interconnected. Yeah. I mean, and at the base of all of that is sort of environmental resilience. You know, mm -hmm. this is the, uh, the quality of our marine ecosystems, our terrestrial mm -hmm. ecosystems, um, uh, and the functioning of those. Mm -hmm. and, and then on top of that, you have important issues around equity and um, gender issues yeah. and um, empowerment. And, mm -hmm. and it's only w when you've got all of that in place uh, and equal access to health yeah. and universal health coverage. It's only then that you can actually get to the development goals. You know, yeah. prosperity can only happen if it's built on these uh, uh, broader frameworks yeah. of e e ecological, environmental sustainability, and social equity. Actually, so um, all of them feed into each other, and uh, and I think that the work we do has, as I mentioned, so many implications for the SDGs that there are uh, those are important policy domains that we can target and address through our grant applications. I have, I have a question I tend to ask persons who are, who are interacting with <laughs> in seminars and I, I look forward to asking to, to receive your thoughts. <laughs> and, and the question goes like this. Now, since the turn of, let's say, the millennium, for mm -hmm. example, we have seen different infectious disease outbreaks and burdens as, as a result of human-animal interactions, especially wildlife. Mm -hmm. We have seen sudden acquired respiratory syndrome even influenza, we have seen Ebola, mm. we have seen vector-borne diseases, chikungunya, Zika, for example. If I were to put you on the spot, mm -hmm. based on your, your pulse on, 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 the, on, on the field of infectious diseases, but also projectively speaking, mm. what may you propose will be the next mm -hmm. outbreak and where <laughs> will it potentially come from? And I'm not going to answer that question. Yeah. Because I think it's 
you can't do you it. You can't do it, yeah. yeah. Um, and we might be able to in 20 years' time. Mm -hmm. Get to that but, point. But yeah. we really Morning. can't do it now. Mm -hmm. um, we know that there are some risk factors mm -hmm. in areas where, but those are largely related to things like land use change, ecological mm -hmm. disturbance, um, movements of people, movements of people, um, uh, changing agricultural systems. Mm -hmm. Now those are happening all over the world. Yeah. And actually, although you know analyses show that there are kind of these hotspots, they're mm -hmm. very heavily. Uh, the, the data are really difficult because of the potential biases that go into them. Yeah. Um, and so even if you're trying to control for those, it can be very difficult. So I don't think we're going to definitely be able Get to say point, when yeah. or where. What we can say is they will, yeah. and we need to be prepared yeah. for that. And yeah. back to my point about yeah. being prepared, I think being prepared means laying the groundwork of dealing with problems that you've got now, mm -hmm. in the here and now. Deal with the zoonoses that we, we've got. Don't worry about the ones that are going to come in, because if we deal with the ones we've got, we're building that whole infrastructure, all that expertise, all those relationships. But if something comes in, we're in a much better place to deal with the it. Mechanisms are already there. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It does provide some challenges though when, let's say, preparing from a budget perspective. Yeah. Or, or let's say from a planning perspective as well, because many times countries will set up their annual budget mm. and then all the expenditures are already lined item out. Yes. But then something emerges yeah. and yeah. they have to reallocate funding, yeah. etc. It's difficult. So, um, I, you know, if you, you were going to say what was the next disease to hit, Pinot Zika probably wouldn't have been on yeah. anyone's top no, list five no, years ago. No. Or chicken <laughs> 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 Yeah, you know, Chicken Guinea might have been a bit more, I think. It was yeah. certainly a bit more on the radar as yeah. far as I'm aware. But Zika wasn't on many people's radar. Mm -hmm. um, senior oh. rates, you know, it's a tapeworm mm -hmm. infection. Who would have thought we're seeing an epidemic? Oh, we seems to be a kind of an epidemic occurring now. So um, I think it's about we know these things will happen. Mm -hmm. You know, all of the risk factors, the contact patterns, the interactions are changing, and that change will change the risk of transmission. And it's very rare. I mean, the good thing is emerging disease events are very rare. We know that spillover is happening all the yeah. time, and mostly fizzles out, nothing much happens. I, but we do have to, it's about responsiveness and preparedness. Um, to my mind now, more than prediction. If we can get to a point of prediction, that'd be fabulous. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, maybe, you know, when we know exactly what kind of mutational changes what severe are going to be, that for that, yes, yeah. and, and if that can happen, that's terrific. But we're, we're, we're not near that at the moment. So we need to be really prepared. And uh, going back to Again, is to be prepared, is to deal with what you've got now, strengthen health systems, the strongest health systems, uh, the ones that can deal with these, with these outbreaks. As persons like yourself, who is actually in the line of where this disease interfaces yeah. with people and wildlife, they'll probably be the first to, 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 to see and observe as well. Yeah. Potentially. And, and, and prevent and control at the same time. Potentially. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. And there are some interesting ideas around kind of sentinel populations. But yeah. again, at a global level, um, these interfaces are everywhere, yeah. and they yeah. they do appear in the, you know, yeah. n not necessarily the thought you know H one N one would pop up where it no. did. Yeah. Um, uh, and for my mind, actually, almost as interesting a question. It's not sort of where um, emerging disease events occur, but why aren't they occurring everywhere? everywhere. <laughs> well, maybe when you look point. at some of these contact patterns in, yeah. you know, some of the wet markets in yeah. Asia, you've got this incredible diversity of host species with uh, amazing diversity of different mm -hmm. pathogens. Um, why aren't we seeing more? Well, know, maybe your point on health problems. systems, because the health system is shrinked by health system. Yeah. So let's say mitigate the spread. That may yeah. also be part of it, yeah. 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 So for me, that's really critical. And, and it's also something that you can invest in now. And it's not a wasted, and this is why, again, it's not a waste to invest in endemic zoonosis, <laughs> yeah. even if you might not be able to demonstrate as much of an impact as something else because building capacity. You, you, you're building capacity and those yeah. core capacities are relevant mm -hmm. uh, across a much wider scale. Mm -hmm. um, and you could make the case for other diseases, not just zoonoses, but zoonoses are important because of the intersectoral collaboration that's required and often the engagement with the community that's required. And those are often really critical features of uh, response capability to epidemics. Very interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, thank you very much. John, do we have any other questions or comments?
I think we're about out of time, so we've got some thank yous coming in in the comments. Appreciation um, for an interesting presentation, uh, but we are uh, yeah we're up against it with our three o'clock. Great. Well, thank you very much for uh, uh, everyone's attention for this. It's been a pleasure to thank you as well for, some of these for being here with us, for yeah. sharing your experiences with us as well, and to stimulate the conversation further mm. as we engage this topic of one world, one health, mm. and one medicine. Yeah. Well, that's it for our two-way edition. Look forward to you guys joining us once again in November. And until that time, it's goodbye for now. And on behalf of John Soap, myself, Satish Padesi, and Donna Walker, your online team, we look forward to completing this course very soon as well as we wrap up the course, as well as we come to the end of 2017. It's goodbye for now. Yeah. Goodbye.